Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Center for Practice Excellent Speaker Series. My name is Zubin Austin, and I'm the Academic Director for the Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our session today. Without any further ado, let me turn it over to our moderator for the speaker series, Annalise Mathers. Enjoy today's session. Thank you so much, Zubin, and a big welcome to everyone joining us online. But a lot of people interested in this event, so I think more people will trickle in as we get going. Um, just before we get started today, I just want to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so I acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and that this land continues to be home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I invite the audience to also consider a land acknowledgement for wherever you might be joining us from today. So today's event is focused on using a health technology or HTA lens to look at medication reconciliation, MedRec, and other healthcare processes. Our presenter for today is Jim Bowen, and he is a clinical research manager with the pro within the Program for Health System and Technology Evaluation at the Toronto General Hospital Research Institute, which is also affiliated with the Theta Collaborative at the University Health Network in Toronto. He is also an assistant professor within IHPME here at the University of Toronto, which is the Institute for Health Policy, Management and Evaluation. And he's also an adjunct cl um, assistant clinical professor in the Department of Health Research, Methods, Evidence and Impact at the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster University. His research activities over the past 18 years have focused on health technology assessment, including the development of methods to conduct studies designed to help inform health policy decisions related to technology and interventions used within the, the Ontario healthcare system. Jim holds a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy and Master of Science from the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto. And amidst all that, he sometimes finds time to work part-time as a community pharmacist. So please join me in welcoming Jim, who's going to start us off with a presentation, followed by remarks from our discussion, discussant, Andrew Wiley, and then we'll have time at the end for audience Q&A. Thanks, Jim, and I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks. I'm just gonna share my screen here and we'll get going. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for the opportunity to speak to you uh, and to Zubin and Annalise and Andrew for kind of going along on this a uh, little bit of a journey we're gonna have over the next uh, hour or so. Um, I hope that uh, it will be a, something that will be of interest to everybody and we're going to have an opportunity for some uh, interesting discussion. So I just want to see if I can get my next slide to go on here and we'll, perfect. So I just wanted to kind of, because we're doing health technology assessment, I wanna give sort of my perspective and disclosures. Um, I, I have a whole bunch of different parts of my career. I've been a researcher doing HTA for the past 18 years. Um, I've worked in part-time in community pharmacy. Um, I did a little bit of a stint in the pharmaceutical industry for a period of time working at Eli Lilly. And I worked in hospital pharmacies for a about 14 years as well. Um, other than that, I have actually no other financial disclosures or financial interest in the topic. So how did I actually get involved in uh, doing health economics, healthcare resource utilization and, and costs? Well, um, it was actually a few years ago um, when uh, my wife's uh, lab partner, who some of you might recognize in this picture, um, passed over to me the proverbial pager or the torch for the uh, Digimedics uh, pharmacy dispensing system and to become the uh, systems an, uh, administrator at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And from about that point onward, when I started getting involved in Ontario case costing and uh, pharmacy workload measurement, um, it evolved into an interest in uh, health economics. Um, I also did some work, this is again looking way, way back, and so anybody that kind of can look back to the 1990s, um, we did some work at Sinai at the time uh, looking at exactly this topic, and um, for those of you that might be able to see the topics, you can see that uh, familiar faces as well as similar topics tied to MedRec. Um, that being said, I have colleagues that are going to be online that have a lot more knowledge with respect to medication reconciliation, done some excellent work over the past uh, few decades in this topic. And I hopefully what I can do is bring some uh, different perspective uh, at this uh, question. Uh, 
So what we're gonna do is we'll do a really brief overview of HTA. Um, and we're gonna kind of then take a look at medication reconciliation through that HTA lens. Um, Andrew's gonna talk for a little bit and then hopefully we'll have an opportunity to have uh, uh, robust uh, questions and uh, discussion about uh, the topic. So let's first of all, uh, let's look at uh, health technology assessment and, and what it is. Uh, fortunately, uh, Dr. Brian O'Rourke and uh, colleagues um, at an international level have uh, struck a, a new definition or a revised definition of HTA. And it is a multidisciplinary process that uses explicit methods to determine value of a health technology at different points in this life cycle. For the purpose is to inform decision making in order to promote equitable, efficient, and a high quality uh, health system. Uh, the thing is, is that the health technology definition within this uh, framework um, actually is fairly broad reaching. Um, it's an intervention developed to prevent, diagnose, or treat medical conditions, promote health, or provide rehabilitation or organize healthcare delivery. Um, the intervention can be a test, a device, medicine, vaccine, procedure, or a program or system. All too frequently what we have is that a lot of the time our HTA um, activities are actually spent towards the first two or three items where we're looking at diagnostic tests, whether we're looking at uh, medical devices or uh, drugs or vaccines. Um, less frequently do we actually take this HTA lens and apply it to a procedure or to a, a program or the health system as a whole. And so that's why I sort of thought it was interesting to kind of try and take this uh, area that I've been working in for the past uh, uh, several years and try and apply it to something that is relevant to, very relevant to uh, pharmacy practice currently. So one of the challenges is that when in this HTA framework, we're here to try and help decision makers make policy decisions and to provide information uh, for them to be able to make decisions with respect to access, with respect to funding. Um, and in that uh, decision-making process, they have to uh, consider many, many factors as a part of their uh, deliberations. Um, so the dimensions that we generally try and look at within HTA are listed here. So we generally, we will obviously looking at efficacy and, efficacy and safety, um, sometimes social and cultural issues, costs and economics usually are also at the forefront of uh, doing HTA. But sometimes less frequently do we look at organizational, um, ethical and uh, legal components, as well as environmental uh, aspects within HTA. Um, this is a slide that I generally have been using for the past uh, few years to try and get some uh, idea of uh, what does this look like from the standpoint of HTA reports and sort of the frequency of uh, evaluation. Um, the slide is actually fairly uh, old from a study from 2005, if you want to consider that to be sort of old. Um, however, it does give a really good uh, understanding of what we do within HTA and the frequency at which these topics are um, addressed. Um, some of this has uh, changed over the past few decades. This is uh, looking at uh, data from 1989 to 2002. However, in general, uh, from the work that we've done um, in the past, I can say that we uh, generally will take a look at these aspects more frequently than, uh, than not. And sometimes the items off to the right of the uh, graph are not necessarily um, considered as frequently within the HTA uh, environment. So one of the challenges or things that we need to look at with respect to HTA is actually understanding our evaluation perspective. Um, it really becomes important to say for whom are we making this decision and from what perspective are we looking at uh, the outcomes and which uh, perspective are we looking at the costs, um, as well as trying to get an understanding of for whom are we making this decision. And sometimes when we do HTA, we end up having to actually look at multiple uh, components. One of the challenges is that we have a tendency to operate in silos when we do this work. And it becomes a bit of a challenge when you're trying to make a decision at a societal level to really get a grasp, if we don't look at it, how that's affecting the patient or the practitioner. And same thing from an institutional level, understanding what's going on at the hospital. So which evidence do we generally look at? Well, we take a look at uh, obviously systematic reviews, uh, randomized control trials, safety, um, economic evaluations, and organizational and uh, patient-related items. 
Um, just a reminder for those of you that have uh, done work in economic evaluation, those of you who haven't, um, just to kind of recap, um, what economic evaluations are is where we're looking at uh, making treatment choices and looking at the upfront costs as well as the costs associated with the consequences as well as the effects or the benefits uh, or uh, harms associated with uh, an individual intervention. Um, when we take a look at that, we end up calculating an incremental cost effectiveness ratio or an incremental cost utility ratio as a part of our work. Uh, and as a reminder, there are different types of economic evaluations, uh, cost minimization analyses, where we're looking at um, different alternatives. We're just looking at the dollar comparisons and we're making an assumption in that environment that there is no difference in the outcomes. Um, the challenge with that is that's probably never really true. Um, so we don't necessarily use cost minimization analyses or cost consequence analyses as, as frequently. Uh, cost effectiveness analyses, cost utility analyses, and uh, less frequently uh, cost benefit analyses where we work to measure the outcomes in dollars. Um, frequently what you'll see is cost utility analyses or cost effectiveness analyses. And with cost utility analyses, we are using a common uh, outcome measure of quality adjusted life years in uh, the denominator. When we address uh, organizational related issues in uh, HTA, uh, we do take a look at diffusion, um, centralization sometimes of the technologies, the utilization patterns and who is going to be using the technology for at times, the technology itself may uh, not necessarily uh, behave the same way in different practitioners or in different patient populations. Um, access, uh, skills and routines, training becomes important. Uh, we've done some work where we've had to really be aware of uh, learning curves associated with uh, our interventions that we were studying uh, strictly because there, it is a functional skill. And as well, from an organizational standpoint, we have to understand our education and training. All of these things become relevant when we start taking a look at the uh, environment of uh, medication reconciliation. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move forward. Um, of course, from a patient related perspective, uh, we want to understand uh, the social impact, um, ethical considerations, um, equity. Are we making sure that the technology itself is available to those that need it? Um, are we meeting uh, the needs of vulnerable individuals um, or equal um, access to uh, information, acceptability, and obviously, as we mentioned before, um, quality of life uh, from a patient-related uh, perspective and uh, patient-related outcomes. So what happens when we use an HTA lens to take a look at uh, technologies that uh, we uh, use within pharmacy practice? And I just want to kind of review, and this is for everybody that's uh, quite familiar, um, HTA is really actually nothing new to pharmacy as a whole. Um, I think I try and tell students that we've actually been doing HTA processes in some fashion um, for multiple, multiple years uh, in our uh, work that we do for formulary review process, processes, whether that be in the hospital or um, whether that be um, at a provincial or a jurisdictional level. And so these are the concepts that we use all the time when we're actually evaluating what we're gonna do from the standpoint of reimbursement or inclusion of drugs. Um, but one of the challenges is, is that sometimes this framework does not actually get applied equitably to all technologies that we actually bring into our health system. We spend time doing a lot of effort um, because we are able to understand um, drug costs and incremental benefits and the data is there. So we're able to do that, but sometimes that uh, practice should also potentially be applied to um, other uh, interventions as well. So let's just take a look. Um, the reason why medication reconciliation is fairly uh, uh, something to be able to look at is that it's actually something that we're measuring. Um, and uh, we have the ability to understand that this is a, uh, uh, a part of pharmacy clinical practice that we're able to um, put into different places within a person's length of stay, and also to be able to um, under define a process uh, from a quality perspective from beginning of admission through the transition points and then through to uh, discharge at, back out into the community. And so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar sort of with the definition of medication reconciliation. We don't necessarily need to work through to uh, read this. 
Um, one of the challenges is when we start taking a look at uh, medication reconciliation data, however, is that there are a whole series of outcomes that uh, have been reported within the literature. And uh, also trying to understand where these outcome measures are actually relevant, um, going back to those silos that I uh, showed earlier on in the presentation. A lot of the times we will see data that are gonna be looking at uh, medication errors and discrepancies, adverse drug events, um, emergency room visits. But as we end up getting down further into this uh, list, um, we don't see as many uh, studies looking at uh, more uh, sort of clinically relevant or, or societally relevant uh, outcomes such as um, morbidity, disability, uh, mortality, and also quality of life. And so that becomes a bit of a challenge when you end up looking through this literature base to, to see what we are, are actually capturing. So let's kind of change things up. Um, let's start with safety, because it's for this reason that we actually are looking at medication reconciliation as the primary uh, uh, rationale to try and prevent uh, adverse uh, uh, drug reactions secondary to um, not necessarily knowing what people are on um, and as they transition into our healthcare uh, settings. Um, I I think this is a really, really uh, good poster. Uh, this is back in 2012, and I'm sure many of you recognize this. And what it does is it actually communicates uh, the fact that medication communication failures impact everyone. And taking that uh, through to what I showed with respect to the silos or the components um, affecting the patient and family, affecting the healthcare system, and affecting society. I think the other important part with respect to this uh, uh, poster and uh, its communication is that it's a multi-stakeholder uh, commitment and that the medication safety as a whole and medication reconciliation is actually a multidisciplinary thing that we need to uh, all consider as a part of our practice as well as our um, health system as, as a whole. So um, as we're aware, medication uh, medrec um, is uh, based sort of on the general uh, idea that we're able to, uh, through reconciliation, reduce the number of medication errors after discharge, as well as uh, hopefully impact those other income outcomes um, that I have uh, outlined in the previous slide. Um, the Accreditation Canada uh, made it a part of our required organizational practices in 2005. And if we take a look at the current um, Accreditation Canada communication, um, we do see that medication reconciliation is a strategic priority and that it is something that uh, we're making sure that we try to um, improve to uh, use at all care transitions. I think the other thing that is also important to keep in mind is that it is really a clinical pharmacy key performance indicator. Um, one of the things that um, Andrew and I were talking about uh, in preparation for this talk is that um, medication reconciliation actually becomes a fairly um, clear uh, measurable activity. So it is actually, a, 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 although we are trying to track how much we, is done, we also have to understand that by using medication reconciliation as a measure, we're also then uh, looking at quality of care and also the uh, steps that are going in between and that accompany it, whether it be uh, really good medication review, clinical intervention, communication between uh, practitioners uh, and, and such. So it becomes a safety uh, component of our uh, quality practice measures uh, within our health system. Um, one of the challenges, however, comes in the fact that uh, when we start taking a look at the outcome measures uh, and we kind of change our, 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 our process to this HTA uh, domain, um, we find that it's sometimes hard um, to actually tie benefit from a clinical trial perspective um, and also the literature into uh, tangible outcomes. And there's a high degree of uncertainty associated with the outcome measures. Uh, these are two rapid reviews that were done, one in 2015, and sorry, I forgot to put the date on the other one here, that was done in, uh, sorry, one in 2012 and one in 2015. Um, one is through CADETH, which is our Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, and the other through Health Quality Ontario uh, and a rapid review through uh, HQO. 
And both of these rapid reviews at the time, uh, even up to 2015, um, really stated that there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty associated with the outcome measures and the data uh, pertaining to medication uh, reconciliation uh, specifically. Um, if we move forward in taking a look at the clinical evidence and uh, obviously we try and find what systematic reviews uh, are available, um, we also find that uh, in this Cochrane review from 2018, um, that the authors uh, concluded that the impact of medication reconciliation interventions, and particularly pharmacist-mediated interventions on medication discrepancies, is uncertain due to the certainty of evidence being low, very low, sorry. And there's no certainty of the effect of the intervention on the secondary outcomes of ADEs, PADEs, and healthcare resource utilization. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of this, uh, when we look at the Cochrane, we're looking at randomized control trial evidence. And so a lot of the, we have a huge body of literature with respect to medication reconciliation, medication review, but not necessarily as much RCT evidence um, that is um, providing us with information to uh, support uh, from an HTA perspective, the intervention. Um, I did try and get optimistic, and this is actually the Optimist trial, um, where we uh, recently published in uh, 2018, uh, where they did take a look at medication interventions. So it's not just medication uh, reconciliation, but um, multiple interventions. And this study uh, was fairly large with 1,467 individuals, um, and people were randomized to usual care, basic intervention, or an extended intervention. And this study did find that the extended intervention, uh, which consisted of a medication review, medication reconciliation at discharge, and motivational interview approach, um, did actually uh, uh, have a difference in uh, readmission rates at 30 days uh, and readmission at 180 days, and also in their composite outcome. Um, there are other outcome measures such as uh, um, mor um, morbidity um, or ED visits um, did not necessarily show that there was, sorry, um, did not necessarily show that there was a um, significant difference, but we do have that this extended care intervention uh, compared to usual care did make a difference. Um, so what we have is that it is evidence to show that this does work. The challenge is, is that these are also multifaceted interventions uh, that need to be put into play uh, to be able to show uh, differences with respect to healthcare resource use and uh, readmissions. Um, just going back to the Optimist uh, study, I was. Uh, it says in the text of this paper that there was an economic evaluation to be done and that it most certainly would be cost effective. However, when I went and retrieved the paper, um, unfortunately, the authors actually presented a cost consequence analysis and did not actually do what we had uh, outlined as an incremental analysis. And really, uh, the, the opportunity is there to look at that data, uh, at least from the paper I found, to actually look at the cost uh, effectiveness in a, maybe a bit more uh, robust way versus uh, merely doing a cost consequence. Cost consequence generally will assume that um, we have uh, equal outcomes. And so therefore, really just looking at the cost uh, differences. So, when we look at economic evaluation, um, I was really only able to find one or two, and this is just an example from uh, the COACH program. Again, it is a uh, intervention that consists of multiple components. Um, it's very, very challenging, and, and as we'll I'll talk about, to actually try and uh, separate out all these components. And one of the things that this study found was actually it was less effective and less costly um, than usual care. And so if we get our traditional sneeze diagram or, or scatter plot, um, we see that the uh, intervention itself actually has um, a lower uh, quality of life overall, and but also at uh, lower costs, um, which doesn't necessarily uh, bode very well when we start taking a look at the evidence. One of the things with respect to the cost effectiveness analyses, however, is that there are uh, cost effectiveness analyses that show that in certain patient populations, uh, medication reconciliation um, is a cost effective um, intervention. So I think uh, just to kind of uh, move forward, uh, the organizational implications, I think is where things really, really uh, come into play with respect to the intervention as a whole. 
Um, so back uh, a few years ago, uh, working with Dr. Han Holbrook at, uh, in Hamilton at the um, Hamilton Health Sciences and uh, St. Joe's, um, we did a study look at actually process mapping and looking at uh, how this can be a critical step towards quality improvement in the MedRec process. Um, some of the things that we found, uh, because the MedRec process had been allowed to, or had, had grown organically within the uh, three teaching hospitals, was that there was a general um, a lack of use of all the available medication sources. Uh, we had duplication of clinicians uh, repeating medication histories and not necessarily one targeted specific individual doing the work. Um, also, with respect to the best possible medication history, uh, when the uh, evaluation was done, we found that there was a lack of timeliness for the completion, and I'm sure these things are people are, 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 are kind of shaking their heads with. Um, lack of standardization of the MedRec process, as well as a suboptimal uh, communication of MedRec issues between physicians and pharmacists. Um, the other challenge from an organizational standpoint, and, and you know, this is actually looking at a, uh, the marquee study where it was using a uh, quality improvement uh, intervention for uh, looking at uh, medication reconciliation. Um, they actually didn't find uh, differences as well. And, and Olavo and uh, Edward uh, did a really nice editorial in uh, BMJ uh, Quality Safety, um, really trying to understand whether or not it was ineffective or really commenting on the aspects of uh, it being hard to implement. And they really uh, I highlighted four themes of relative advantage, uh, trying to mean things as a low complexity, uh, looking at absorb or observability, as well as uh, issues tied to technical support uh, with respect to um, MedRec. Um, we also have the advantage in Canada that we've had some excellent work done um, both in uh, Quebec as well as in Alberta, trying to see whether or not we are able to use electronic um, modalities to help facilitate the outcomes. And the uh, work from uh, Dr. Tamblin in, in uh, Montreal in Quebec and uh, looking at the sort of the front end side of things of being able to get access to records um, at admission by hospital pharmacists. And on the back end, uh, in, uh, work done in Alberta to take a look at the discharge process. Again, both of these studies showed some benefits, but not necessarily in the more concrete outcomes or the more um, clinically relevant outcomes uh, that we might uh, think that we would want to try and see with respect to our interventions. So um, there's also a work that's been done by uh, my colleague at, uh, at Theta uh, through uh, Alexandra has a dissertation, uh, looked at the Alberta healthcare system at a system level and looked at the uh, pre-post design of the implementation of MedRec in specific institutions across the province and um, really found no significant impact in ADEs. Now we are looking at a pre-post design, but the one nice thing that uh, Alexander has in her dissertation is this uh, statement of unsurprising that this evaluation of one component of a complex bundle of interventions did not in itself significantly impact ADE uh, related health system utilization. So I think that's something we need to really keep in mind as we take a look at an HTA approach to uh, evaluating uh, medication reconciliation. What I think that we really need to do is, is look at more integrated evaluation, integrated thinking. Uh, there are three things that became really apparent um, and work that's being done here in, in Toronto um, by our, our colleagues. Um, one is really from an HTA point of view, work that is looking at systems thinking in HTA. Um, all too frequently in HTA, in our domain, we look at things from a very uh, discrete uh, component but we don't necessarily as uh, commonly look at the entire system or look at the technology within the health system as a whole. So there is some work moving forward uh, published in uh, uh, 2021 um, by uh, people from our group uh, looking at systems thinking as it pertains to HTA. Um, then there's provincial level analyses. This is work, uh, uh, I think it's uh, done out of the faculty and Lisa Dolovich obviously is uh, a senior author on this one. Um, of looking at provincial level analysis. And uh, this is really, really important, uh, looking at uh, not so much the MedRec perspective, but looking at the uh, components of um, uh, MedsCheck 
And uh, really it's a, an eloquent analysis uh, looking at uh, the effect of uh, meds check. Uh, the challenge is, is that the participation or the utilization meds check is uh, relatively low in our province. Um, and uh, uh, that makes it a bit more challenging to look at, but may, it may also be due, um, as I'll, I'll mention in a sec, uh, due to our documentation processes. And then finally, uh, Olavo and his, and his group are looking at um, mixed methods. Uh, this is the uh, prompt study, uh, which gives us some insight as to our transitions of care and the interprofessional uh, work between practitioners within the community um, to hospital and what things are important for practice and for systems uh, between the uh, institutions. So I think really what we want to try and do as my general thought is that we have to kind of not necessarily from an HTA perspective, look solely at uh, sort of the med rec as an entity. I just actually really find it hard and challenging based on what I understand from an HTA point of view to really do that. I think we have to really look at the broader picture of medication optimization. And this is obviously coming out, of, this is coming out of NICE in the UK and a definition of uh, medication optimization. So we have to try and maybe take a look at a broader system level we may not necessarily be able to find those discrete um, measurement of, of benefit within the individual silos as we had before, but we want to try and find ways that we can actually uh, look at it across at a societal perspective and pharmacy practice and medication management um, as, a, as a whole. So this is where I practice. This is my uh, Young's Pharmacy and Home Care. And so I have to try and reflect from my practice environment. As I mentioned before that um, I've actually not practiced in hospital pharmacy uh, for uh, well over um, maybe 20 years or so. Um, but I need to kind of take a look at it from a community point of view, from my practice hat versus my researcher hat. And um, some things that I find that I just have to kind of, uh, things that we need to consider as, as sort of sitting there as a, as a community pharmacist uh, and understanding what our portion of the, of the work is uh, to, for medication reconciliation, um, where we get calls from uh, hospital pharmacies looking for profiles. Uh, we end up getting uh, discharge prescriptions uh, that come in sometimes on a Sunday afternoon at four o'clock in the afternoon um, when people are discharged and you're trying to work through uh, 20 uh, meds or so. Um, and we really have to try and find a way that we can get um, more equitable access to information. Um, one of the challenges is that we only have only, in, at least in the hospital level, for those of you that are working in hospital, we can only really see the drug benefit uh, profiles for 3.8 million people in Ontario. Um, we really don't have access to all of the private billings. And there may be some ways that we can look at trying to make sure that that billing information or the, the, the utilization, forget about the billing, not so much the cost and the, and the actual how much money was paid, but what was dispensed um, to try and push that back into a centralized repository, which would really help with the uh, components. The other thing that I think of when I look at my sort of my community clinical practice in the community is just the documentation and the reimbursement of these activities. Um, even though you may spend 20, 20 minutes trying to get somebody's discharge prescriptions, are we really documenting it? I'm not so much worried about reimbursement, but are we documenting it in a way so that we're actually able to have that continuity information from a workload measurement point of view um, in the system? And is that uh, moving it or, or consistently going forward to our provincial data sets so that we can actually analyze this at a systems level? Um, uh, reflecting on things, uh, we have to really look at technology improvement. Um, when we consider the fact that the fax machine and the telephone are truly our ways that we're still communicating for the most part of our work, uh, is this really the best way to communicate this medication information? Um, it, things haven't really changed tremendous, tremendously from back in 1998 when we had that seamless care poster. Um, and do we need to do this in a targeted way? Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that uh, with Andrew's uh, presentation, uh, looking at high risk populations and maybe not necessarily in everyone. So the challenge is how do we get from community to acute care and back in a safe manner? Um, I think that HTA can give us a way of uh, examining this evidence, uh, examining uh, MedRAC and within the health system. Um, I think some of the challenges that we have is that uh, the data doesn't necessarily consistently demonstrate that the processes are providing incremental benefit um, compared to usual care. And I think a lot of that really ties to the heterogeneity of the intervention, uh, the outcome measures we're looking at, 
And uh, finally, as, as many, many people have, have, have published on um, implementation challenges. Um, we have a complex intervention. Um, and as I have uh, outlined, there's a need for more complex uh, methods of evaluation. Um, and perhaps just evaluating this one component is actually not of value. We need to be far more holistic in what we're doing. So um, just to wrap up, um, I just want to put one thing in your head uh, from the standpoint of documentation. Um, what my 50-year-old uh, self now would say to my younger 20-year-old self is that, uh, and, and borrowing from a bit of a sports analogy, um, we need to keep score while we are practicing. A lot of the times we can't analyze this stuff because we're just actually not documenting in a consistent manner uh, what we're doing in pharmacy practice, um, which makes these system level uh, evaluations uh, challenging. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And we're gonna flip over to uh, Andrew for his uh, uh, chat for talk. Slides. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jim, um, for that presentation and how much you covered. I really appreciated just kind of the background you gave on a lot of the HTA processes and then moving into MedRAC. Um, so audience members, please please get start to get your questions ready. Um, I'm just going to pass it over now to our discussant for today, who is Andrew Wiley. Um, Andrew is a senior manager of the quality and academic practice for pharmacy as well as the Pharmacy Residency Program Director at the Sinai Health System, and more specifically at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, so he is joining us, very lucky to have him to provide some additional remarks and comments um, building off of Jim's presentation, and then we'll open the floor to audience question and answer. So Andrew, I'll pass it over to you uh, right now. Thanks, Annalise. I'll just do a sound check and make sure everyone can hear. Yep, you're good, you can see your Great. slide. Thanks. So uh, thanks for the invitation and thanks uh, Jim for such a thought provoking talk uh, and daring us to look at the human component of efficient spending. Uh, I think this is actually a dreadfully threatening idea for those on the front lines. And I think that there's a, a possibility that they'll think that this is a threat to their value. And so I thought we'd start off by uh, trying to avoid that perception and that uh, hopefully we can leave today as uh, friends or at least friendly colleagues. So, uh, I thought we should probably agree on that uh, MedRec, broadly applied at all transitions of care, will help us detect and resolve frequent discrepancies that are unlikely to harm people. So something like Tylenol dosing, uh, infrequent discrepancies with modest potential for harm, and then to potentially detect rare discrepancies that could cause severe harm. I think uh, we should also agree that pharmacists have been shown to do this uh, better than uh, other allied professionals and one can argue why, but I think that that's been shown in the literature. Uh, also that our healthcare system is expensive and the pace of spending concerns most people from most perspectives and that uh, getting more money to hire more pharmacists is a tricky thing to do. And then lastly, that when we're competing for finite resources, I think um, we really need to keep into perspective whether or not it's actually serving patients the best and uh, society and not exclusively to grow the pharmacy empire. And also to keep in mind that if we're gonna do that, that we really need to generate evidence that demonstrates the value. And I circle value there uh, because that's the key of what uh, Jim is uh, leading us to think about. So if all that uh, fits with you and we can still be friends at the end of the day, we can thank Jim again altogether uh, for the thought provoking presentation and uh, continue on. So I think there's some professional considerations here. Uh, first is that um, Alavo and others have looked at this and uh, when they've asked pharmacists whether they find MedRec to be uh, satisfying, they say yes, and they believe that it's impactful. And there's literature that Jim's reviewed that um, supports that. When we think of uh, constraints, uh, constraints on spending and uh, a difficulty in just going out and asking for more pharmacists to be hired, we end up with these trade-offs that need to be taken. And I see this regularly amongst the staff at Sinai. And so uh, to create a situation here, if you have a patient with uh, HIV and transplant and an unplanned uh, admission, uh, you might view medication reconciliation one way uh, against, say, amoxicillin counseling. And that's a very different scenario than if a patient comes in with a planned admission on amoxicillin uh, and you have uh, HIV and transplant medication counseling to do. So what I'm trying to highlight there is that 
um, the pharmacist has to make a decision about where their time is best allocated towards and would it be to a complex patient being admitted um, or would it be to complex medications which uh, need the pharmacist time to counsel on them. And so I think when we're going to mandate something, as has been the case with uh, MedRec by various organizations, is that we need to be very careful and that the threshold for mandating this should be very high when we've got fixed resources and we end up with trade-offs uh, like the scenario there for complex patients and uh, patient counseling. As we uh, alluded to before, uh, healthcare is expensive. Uh, there's a lot of money being spent and COVID certainly didn't help us. And I think once, you know, irrespective of whether it's COVID or usual healthcare times is that whenever we start to spend a lot of money, we attract some attention. And I think that's where HTA becomes very appealing. When we've got very expensive drugs, then the requirement is to have a health technology assessment involved. And I think there's some consideration that we should have there that if we're going to end up spending a lot of money by having pharmacist uh, staff do uh, MedRec, that we should have uh, health technology uh, assessment involved to defend that. And without that kind of information is we're going to end up where uh, decision makers use their gut or they have a panel of experts that will make the decision for us. We have some examples of where uh, health technology assessment has been applied and where there's um, uh, an effort to have judicious use of resources. And MRI is a, an example that gets brought up a lot. And so the famous example is that you uh, rake the leaves too aggressively or something like that, and you get to lower back pain and uh, come on into your physician. And what uh, the system was experiencing is that MRIs would be ordered often for people with lower back pain. And so what Choosing Wisely is promoted is to say, you should use this judiciously, apply it to a select group of people, and they've identified the people that they think that, that should be um, applied to. And we have lots of other examples. So we've got pre-op blood work. So it used to be that uh, everybody got a little bit of blood drawn and we'd see what was going on with their kidneys and what was going on with their electrolytes. And choosing wisely is encouraging that there should be a subpopulation of people that um, are, um, are really warrant the pre-op blood work. So I think that we need to ask ourselves what services are really protected from questions. And so whenever we've made something mandatory, we've really set it up to be um, past the point of uh, questioning. And I think this is what we're coming back to today is whether we really should be looking at this from an efficiency standpoint. And so it's not very exciting to talk about MRI and blood work because the MRI machine and the, uh, the blood itself don't feel prosecuted when you say, um, should the, uh, the image be taken or should we have a look at the blood? It gets a little bit different when we start to say, what about a physician taking time to complete history and physical? And what about, uh, are we dispensing the correct medication and should we double check that? And then I think we find that uh, MedRec could fall into that uncomfortable category too, where we're starting to ask some questions about what, um, what people are doing as opposed to using a machine or drawing blood. And there's probably some influences that we have here. Uh, one of how often the problem's occurring, how likely it is that we're going to detect it if we're going to intervene. And uh, I think discomfort with loss. I think um, saying we're not going to take some pre-op blood is that there's not that uh, human element to it. But if we were to say to the pharmacy profession, you need to scale back on MedRec, that that would be uncomfortable for many. And that may be a threat to the workforce um, that is uh, completing that task. And then uh, just back to widespread applications that if we're mandating that is that we must be uh, maybe less inclined to ask those questions. And so something that uh, people often come back to is what if we miss somebody? What if we don't do the MRI and that back pain was actually early uh, cancer? There was a tumor in the spine. From a population standpoint, we might say, well, we need a tool to look at risk factors to with uh, a high positive predictive value to figure out how to allocate resources. From an independent level, independent patient level, they may just say, listen, uh, do everything you can for me and make sure that you don't miss something. So um, I think um, some questions here uh, would be around, um, really, should we make um, MedRec mandatory? And what's the context of that as we think about health technology assessment? And, what I'm showing here is that I think the answer is the same, is that um, if we're saying MedRec should be mandatory, I think that we should be doing what uh, Jim's proposed, and that is that 
we need to complete the health technology assessment to characterize its value, to help with advocacy. Uh, we have a bit of an issue that if we complete it, it'll be without a comparator to other pharmacy delivered activities. And it will be a gigantic task. And I think that's true uh, whether or not um, people feel that MedRex should be mandatory. And so, Jim, we wish you well. Good luck with this uh, mammoth task you're about to undertake. I thought that maybe we could um, some give you some ideas about uh, how you're going to survive this. So I'm proposing here that uh, in models that might look at this, that there'd be several different elements that you'd consider. And uh, I think this might be an interesting thing for us to discuss, but do we cover the entire population with MedRAC or do we cover a portion? And that might be related to patient complexity and whether we pick people who are very complex or low. To maybe look at the effect size, many of the uh, outcomes that, uh, that Jim presented that we may be able to quantify as a number needed to treat. Uh, with the outcome that we select, we may be down to a process measure, we may be down to mortality. We might look at the durability of this with uh, taking vaccine history and people often we write down their vaccine history and or their allergy history and they get asked again at a future point and there's different documentation. So just that we've done MedRec and communicated it doesn't necessarily mean in a month that people will be looking at the correct list. Time intensity and perhaps provider would be other uh, interesting questions to ask. So that's really the serious part of this. I think we'd have some fun in just uh, talking about Zubin for a moment. So Zubin was the MC for, uh, for the uh, wedding of Jim and myself. We're not married to each other, but um, of course, um, uh, <laughs> we have our own spouses as Jim has uh, introduced you to his. Um, I think there seems to be some theme of thinking partners and marriages here. So uh, Zubin seems to have been a thinking partner of mine and clearly of Jim's, and he seemed to help us with marriage. Uh, my practice leaders, Virginia and Katie, one of them just got married last month, and uh, my wife, who uh, exercised poor judgment in accepting my proposal, is that um, there's a theme there of thinking partners and marriages. And Jim has uh, has courageously proposed that uh, we marry health technology assessment and pharmacy practice. And uh, I think um, there's, a, there's a bit of fun for us to think about. I will leave it on that slide and perhaps actually stop share. And thank you, Annalise. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Thanks you for enough. the slides and particularly that last slide. <laughs> very, very nice to just highlight the creative processes that we're working behind the scenes here. Um, thank you both, Jim and Andrew, for your, for your presentations today. I'd like to open the floor to our audience online. Um, I think Jim and Andrew have both expressed that they're comfortable if people just want to use the raise hand function and then unmute yourself and ask your, ask your question or, or make your comment. Um, so we'll open the floor for that now, uh, if anyone... Has a, has a pressing question that they'd like to ask. I think also understanding people's perspectives, um, you know, it's also really important. You know, it's not so much we have an explicit right or wrong answer. I think that we have a, a high degree of, of different practice environments. And what your learnings have been through your clinical practice is to, um, how does this fit? What do, how do you perceive what we need to be able to do? And um, uh, the challenges that people are faced with um, in, in practicing and looking at MedRec, but also looking at clinical pharmacy as a whole and allocation of, of resources. So um, any of those thoughts would be appreciated because um, I, I by no means have any degree of functional expertise in doing the hospital pharmacy side of things, but um, the challenges that are, are faced, I, I, can, I can see are, are, are challenging as, as a part of uh, the literature that uh, I've, I've taken a look at. Yeah. No, thank you, Jim. And maybe while people are thinking, um, just building off of that um, point a little bit, I think one of the things that's very intriguing to me is just the fact kind of that Andrew touched on when he was wrapping up of the fact that MedRec is um, mandated, it's, in, it's accredited. And so there's kind of that, that preliminary barrier of how we approach something or how we question something. So Curious again. I'm not coming. Uh, I'm not a pharmacist practicing pharmacist myself. Um, so just curious if you could give us a bit of background about how this actually came to be, like how MedRec actually became to be such a prominent part of pharmacy practice, um, something that emerging professionals are learning about, and how it's also an accreditation requirement. I'd be really curious to learn about that. 
Jim, would you like to comment or uh, would you like me to? I Andrew, I think you're better to comment because you've actually been <laughs> in the environment much more than I have over the past uh, few decades. Sure. So thanks, Annalise. So I think this started, um, we just used to call it clinical pharmacy, and this is what uh, pharmacists did. I think once the communication failures became documented, uh, and some great work was actually done out of Toronto to document um, how often that happened, then it sort of took on a new name, and that gave it status. And from that status, there was advocacy to say that this um, really needs to be integrated into practice, and that mandating it is one way to try to, to get uptake. And so I think that is the, the history behind it. Um, and, um, and then I think that um, the, the big perspective is, is um, just about, um, do we actually have enough bandwidth to mandate this for all patients at all transitions of care? And that's something that has not come into the standards about a percentage target, because I think there's a deep appreciation by the advocates for this that, if you say 100% in everybody at all transitions of care, you're going to weaken the quality of the activities done, or you're going to compromise on something else. Yeah. And perhaps need a lot more staffing in order in order to accomplish that at the same time. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, I think the, the one of the things that I reflected on was the fact that MedRec is a, uh, I think also a, we consider it as, as a proxy indicator for. Um, for quality. In other words, if this is being able to be put in place at an institutional level and it's consistently applied, even if with the attempt to, to consistently apply it, we're raising the bar versus usual care. I think there were some really interesting comments as I was doing some of the reading that, um, you know, we, at least practicing in, in, in teaching hospitals where actually I I practice for we also have a very high standard usual usual level of care and so i think the thing is, is that in some environments in in, in north america or, or globally their usual care is not necessarily as good as what our usual care might be so i think we have to also be aware of that and it's important to have this as a practice indicator it it it, it is a it is something that is showing that there's a quality component being introduced um into things sorry uh, connie you probably have a lot more insight in, in all this yeah, happy to pass it over to Connie if you want to unmute yourself. Well, I really enjoyed the uh, uh, the presentations, Jim and Andrew. It was uh, certainly, uh, I've had many discussions regarding this very thing over the years. Uh, my question is, how um, are students being instructed on prioritizing the services and care that they provide in the faculty now? Because I think students are one way of, of, of moving this kind of thinking forward. Does anybody that's at the faculty, Zubin, who's at the faculty? Or uh, Sherilyn, I'm sorry, I see other faculty members that on there. So it's a, it's a great question, Connie. I'm not directly involved in that uh, at this time. I defer to people who are involved. I think the question of prioritizing is, it's a constant struggle in the, in the, in our education mm -hmm. programs. Um, I don't think we do a very good job of teaching that. I think we expect that when people get into experiential education rotations, that's where they learn about prioritization. Whereas the the function of, of university-based education is really around skill building. Without that really important point that you bring up, I don't know if anybody else who's online, and especially somebody who's perhaps more directly involved in, for example, medication therapy management courses or others may have something to say, but the question you raise points to uh, a significant thing that we need to address both in university-based and experiential ed. Thanks, Ubin. This is perhaps more on the, uh, the theoretical and uh, kind of high level thinking that I'm not accustomed to participating in, but, uh, and I won't out the other person who is, who is, uh, helped me think about this, but I, you know, in, uh, in setting it as a mandatory activity, I think what was suggested to me that I really like the idea of is that it's somewhat deconstructing a profession is that we try to train people to think for themselves and think about prioritization and what matters and what doesn't in that moment when they've got a fixed amount of time. 
And as we take the profession and mandate activities, we reduce the amount of discretion that you give a profession. And something that's really interesting is to, like I think about our one of our emerged physicians who had a bike accident and smashed in his face. He had a patient a week later who came in and had bumped into a kitchen cabinet and they wanted a CT of their head. And he quite literally pulled out his phone and showed them a picture of what his face looked like <laughs> on day one of the crash and said, uh, you know, I didn't need a CT and I will reassure you that you don't need a CT either. And it, it's very much in that context is that he's used his discretion about what he thinks is reasonable and unreasonable and uh, kind of joyfully uh, reassured the patient about what was needed. If we're to give hard boundaries about when to CT and when not, you've taken away, uh, I think, that discretion. And you've also taken away a bit of the patient interaction that is, um, I think, uh, afforded to professionals and really uh, makes for a strong bond. No, thanks one, for that. Sorry, Jim, one, go ahead. Sorry, I think one of the things that we to, to look at, because you know, obviously my contacts is in the community side uh, now, is, is how do we work on this um, improved communication between our silos? Um, th this is this is one of our challenges that we're really faced with. And I, and I truthfully, you know, there's been uh, e-health, there's been trying to look at uh, different ways of trying to uh, get communication, but we spend a tremendous amount of time rekeying in drug information like sorry the actual dispensing part you get a fax you then have 20 drugs on there you're taking you're having technician time we really have to kind of look at our technology to help facilitate this and i think the studies out of alberta and 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 um and and quebec um really really show that you know you can you can do this communication it may only just be one piece of the puzzle but it's common sense that we can have uh, easier way of looking at um, information. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges that really hasn't, and I reflect, I've been practicing for 30, ooh, 30 years. Um, and I don't know that that's really moved all that far, far forward. Um, we started as Zubin, as, as the Digimedics uh, pager went, um, that was 1994. And have we really, really progressed um, in our IT side of things and also breaking down our silos in, um, I guess that's dating us, Subin. It's uh, like what, uh, 27 years or so. So there's 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 work to be done. Maybe not necessarily on the clinical side, but on the um, information technology side that, to try and make this easier. So we can actually not be spending our time calling every single community pharmacy to try and get at people's medication profile um, and, and and process improvement at a at a system level. Really. Um, I think can help facilitate this so we can spend our time doing clinical work versus uh, technical or and, and, and other work. Right. Any other quest, quick questions from the audience? Um, perhaps lots to reflect on uh, from Jim and Andrew's presentation. Um, if not, um, I think we're almost at the time for our session today. So on behalf of Zubin, myself and the Center for Practice Excellence, just like to thank uh, both Jim and Andrew for taking the time to speak with us today um, for the insightful comments and, and hopefully, like I said, giving us lots to think about. Um, really pleased you could join us and um, I will be sharing the recording after the session today. Um, so that will also be available. In other news, we will be wrapping up the 2021 circuit of our CPE events uh, with our final event of 2021 in, on December 2nd. Um, and that will be focused on um, a bit of a different topic than our usual CPE sessions. That will be about launching and scaling educational scholarship and research careers, um, mostly targeted at uh, kind of emerging pharmacy professionals. So stay tuned for that event. Um, thank you to everyone in our audience who's joined us today. I hope everyone stays safe, healthy, and well um, as we move into the last part of 2021. Thank you. Thank you all very much and see you at our next event.